Gillis and I'm from the Liberties in Dublin and uh, always interested in history because it's something that we actually always grew up with. Um, my dad big into history and something he passed on to us as kids and uh, walking around every Sunday uh, afternoon for a walk into town you'd be walking past the, the buildings and he'd be pointing out what happened in 1916 and so on but the way he told the stories it was fascinating so um, that's what got me into it and then the fact that I had an amazing history teacher which Miss Bourne um, in secondary school and again her passion for the subject came across and uh, yeah you get one one good teacher can make a huge difference and uh, I was lucky and I had Miss Bourne for my history teacher and so those two people coming together uh, that's what started me interested in me loving history. Um, it actually came from a previous book I'd written, Revolution in Dublin, which was a photographic book mm. on the events that happened in Dublin between 1930 and 1923. And I'd originally wanted to do a chapter on the women in that book to get them there in their own right, but I just hadn't got enough room okay. in the book. And uh, it was coming up to 2014, so the centenary coming them on and so on, so I suggested to Mary's, mm. um, and they jumped on it. So, and that was in my way to commemorate the centenary of coming them on but the big focus was to do a book on women that we wouldn't necessarily know about and um, get the ordinary people out there because we, we every revolution every movement has to have the big names mm. but they you wouldn't have a movement without the ordinary people and their stories have been forgotten about for so long so it was a chance to get them out and get them highlighted um, and thankfully it worked. Now, uh, could you tell me, one of the ladies that you mentioned is Maud Gahn, who are standing in front of her grave here today. Could you tell me a little bit about her, please? Um, well, Maud Gahn, founder of uh, Nina Heron, which has been an overlooked group. Um, and together with Nafina, they are possibly the most important groups that um, help basically create what happens in 1916. Um, when Maud Gahn, she was an absolute radical. She really didn't give a damn about what people thought of her. Um, and she, from a quite an early young age, she is quite outspoken in her political beliefs and so on. And if she sees something that needs to be done, she will do her best to do it. And granted, some people might say that because of her background, um, she came from a wealthy background, she was able to do that. But why not? You know, rather, it would be better to do something good with your money than not. Mm. And she chose to do something good to help a cause. Um, now, with Nina and Heron, a totally revolutionary group, way ahead of its time. Um, they were basically uh, supporting the use of Irish materials, encouraging um, their members certainly to wear Irish tweed and so on. Um, and it'd be like an early version of the Buy Irish campaign. Mm. They were encouraging, we have these resources here, let us use them. But also, the social conscience that these women had, and Maud Gone, this is one of the, the one of her qualities, I think is the social conscience that she has, that she basically passes on to these other women. Um, that they see what's going on around them, and it's a Dublin organisation, but they're seeing what's going on in the city centre and the tenements in what is the poorest area um, in Ireland, but also the worst slums in Europe are to be found in Dublin City, mm. the second city of the empire. But um, the only options open for certainly young boys at that time was join the British Army, be become cannon fodder. And what Inina set out to do was to educate those kids, to actually give them a chance, um, both boys and girls, possibly the boys because what other option had they got. Mm. Um, and certainly in and around the docks, you know, work wasn't permanent. You know, they, they had really the outlook for them in their future. It was bleak. They wanted to give those kids a choice and they did. Um, but another interesting thing about Inina and Maud Gone also, as well as giving kids a chance to get educated, they also feed the kids mm. of the area. The church come to Inina and Heron. They don't go to the British government, they go to Inina to actually help feed the poor kids of the area. At Little Penny Dinners, which is in Mead Street, is still going today. Mm. Um, the, the, the priests there, together with Inina, 
um, they fed the poor kids of the area and the whole thing was you pay a halfpenny or a penny wherever you could really mm. and despite the fact that so many kids couldn't afford to pay no child went hungry they made do with what they couldn't they fed every single child in that area that needed help Cook Street Liberties area so from a personal point of view that's in my mm. area and I'm so proud that you know there was some involvement there and um, what you then find is in Yena um, set up in 1900 and sort of by 1913 it's starting to change um, and Maud Gone and her colleagues realised that you've got the Irish volunteers being formed, you have um, also the Citizen Army has been formed so maybe in the Indian Heron has gone so far um, and then of course we have Coming to Mons set up um, in 1914, April 1914 and what is really interesting is the Indian branch um, is actually made up of the Indian women so okay. they don't disappear. They basically stay together but form their own branch of coming them on. Um, and then between in 1916, two dominant groups come out in regards to the women. Because mm. although you have coming them on and the different branches within that, the Fairview branch and the Column Kill branch and so on, um, the two dominant groups regarding the women are the Anina branch, which covers the south side of the city, mm -hmm. and then the Irish Citizen Army, the women attached to the Irish Citizen Army. Um, and they are so, so dominant not just in 1916, but in the aftermath as well. And Maud Gone, although she might be sort of in the background at this time, um, she's always there, she's always supporting, and she continues that right up really in, until our dying days, like the Civil War, you know, she's out on the platform, she's preaching, you know, for the prisoners, the relief of the prisoners and so on. So that rebellious spirit, that sense of injustice and trying to make a difference, that never leaves her. Okay. Why do you think, though, they were so dominant, um, the uh, part of the Irish Citizen Army in uh, Fairview, was it? Um, the Indiana branch yeah. and the Citizen Army women. Um, I think those two, uh, th th those two groups, well, the Indiana branch literally had been a, a close group from 1900. Okay. So they've got 14 years to sort of really form a bond, like Marcella Cosgrave, um, Elizabeth O'Farrell was a member, Julia Grenham was a member. Um, you've got all of these women that then, it's like they, they cut their teeth in 1916. Um, it's like a training ground for what they're going to do in the years following. Um, but they're, they're mature women as well by that mm. time. They join in 1900 are quite young but then they've seen 14 years experience 14 years experience this is what we need to do this is how we do it um, and basically get things done with regards to citizen army women mm. um, you have the course the lockout is a huge huge uh, factor there but you've got like the likes of Rosie Hackett and so on Kathleen Lynn Liberty Hall is the place for them and they're in such close contact with each other but they're also in close contact with James Connolly um, so they're developing their own political beliefs as well um, so what they're fighting for when it comes to 1916 they want to ensure that, that is actually upheld. So whereas Fairview, Column Kill, they're only set up in 1914, 1915, these two groups have had the lineage. Yeah. So Nina goes back to 1900, uh, the Citizen Army women go back to 1912, 1914. So those bonds are there, um, they're shaped, they're friendships that will last forever. Um, and they're really tight, they're really close-knit groups. And that then shows both in 1916 and then it continues after. You might be surprised to realize who else answered to the call. This is the Fenian women's blues. Let's remember them.